When has a year in sports ever paid such homage to tradition, even as it ushered in explosive change? 1997 was a year like no other. Well, we finally come full cycle. The Green Bay Packers are back in the Super Bowl after an absence of 29 years. Disqualification means the fight's over. Number 42 from this day forward will never again be issued by a major league club. Sports Illustrated presents The Year in Sports 1997. Day one of sports annual odyssey kicks off with college football's biggest celebration, the bowl games. Rising above the rest were two bowls whose outcomes would determine the national champion. Pasadena served as center stage for quarterback Jake Plummer. Fiery direction led Arizona State to an apparent dazzling comeback against Ohio State. Got it! First and goal for the Sun Devils! Marching Arizona State to within striking distance, Plummer managed to finish off the drive on his own. Plummer in trouble, steps away, cuts free, breaks loose, five, touchdown, Sun Devils! Woo! The snake does it again! Plummer's heroics whipped the Sun Devils faithful into a frenzy, but the Buckeyes' best was yet to come. This is a situation where Ohio State really needs this game, and then the most magical player in college football appears to have beaten them with a scramble. They put in their second-string quarterback. Joe Germain has replaced A kid who grew up in the Arizona area and always dreamed of winning the Rose Bowl. Third down and ten for Germain and the Bucks. And he takes him down the field to win the game. I mean, it was, the kind of, it was the kind of victory that really lifts that whole program. The comeback etched its way into Rose Bowl lore and set up a dramatic showdown for a national championship in the Sugar Bowl. All of a sudden, you get to the night of January 2nd, and you've got a national championship game, just as if you had a playoff. And now, here comes the Seminole, the number one team in the country. Upset-minded Florida was looking to capture its first national title while extracting a measure of revenge for the pounding it had received the previous November in Tallahassee. Steve Spurrier spent literally the entire time between those two games pounding not only into the media's mind that the Florida State players had beaten up his quarterback, but he also told his own players day after day after day. I voice my opinion because uh, my responsibility is for our player's safety, and especially our quarterback in the pocket. Purple back there by himself. Go. High snap, here they come. He gets it away, he's got Hilliard, he's got the ball. In this case, he made changes in his blocking scheme and even more significantly went to a shotgun, which he'd said he'd never do. I think he went to the shotgun not only strategically to beat Florida State, but also sympathetically to save Danny Werfel from punishment. Werfel lets it go again. The Seminole secondary was shredded by the Danny Werfel Ike Hillard combination, a mixed brew that tasted of sweet redemption and sour grapes. I don't like being the winner and having to play somebody again. I mean, it's like a heavyweight champion. Uh, give a guy a rematch when you beat him, huh? The guy that gets beat always wants a rematch. Jackson. Champion doesn't necessarily want one. I, I really don't think who won the first one has much to do with uh, who wins the next one. The Gators' 52-20 dismantling of the Seminoles had finally quenched Florida's thirst for a national championship, further enhancing the resume of the man who delivered them there. Well, it brought a unique uh, sort of closure to the entire thing. In 1966, he was this magical player, won the Heisman Trophy, 
and gave Florida football fans the highest moment they've ever had. 30 years later, he repeats that kind of magic and wins a national championship and gives the Florida fans who are among the most passionate in the country really something to feel emotional about again. There were echoes of past glory, too, for the Green Bay Packers in 97. 29 years had passed since their last championship, and the label title town had long since peeled away. Uh, losing don't tie a knot up in your stomach and make you lose sleep. Then uh, you need to get out of the profession. Suddenly, the hopes of a new generation took flight over Lambeau. I think the big thing that helped the Packers more than anything else is the advent of free agency. They could then show every player in the rest of the league exactly what Green Bay was about. It wasn't this moribund, tundra-like franchise that no player wanted to go to. Reggie White changed all that in the first big year of free agency. Drop straight back. Around the rest of the NFL. Where'd that guy come from? Things were equally exciting. <laughs> Let's go, guys. We're going to knock their ass off. Hey! And the give to Barry Sanders. Cut back over the middle of the 15. Breaks a tackle to the 10. Barry Sanders breaking two or three tackles. Holy mackerel. Jerry Rice became the first receiver to haul in 1,000 passes. But perhaps the most excitement was generated by the expansion Carolina Panthers and Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jaguars playoffs hopes may indeed rest on this play. There's the snap, the place with the kick is up, it's on the way. And it's no good, it's no oh good, my God. it's no good. And the Jaguars are going to the playoffs. Jacksonville's momentum carried through its wild card game and built into a shocking upset of the heavily favored Denver Broncos. Touchdown Jaguars! Cinderella was having a ball. You keep believing, you keep fighting your butts off, find a way to win. Right. We are in the AFC Championship. the running back as an eye back. But the Patriots ended the Jaguars' party short of New Orleans. Meanwhile, the upstart Panthers spoiled the much hoped for Packers versus Cowboys NFC title showdown. He's got it! Touchdown! And zeroed in on some storybook dreams of their own. Kids grow up knee high a grasshopper dreaming about playing a game like today. Freezing, frozen tundra of Lambeau Field. Where else would you want to be? Anywhere but Lambeau, as it turned out. Brett straight back in the pocket. Quick drop. Goes to the outside. There's a fade. It's there. Touchdown, Antonio Freeman. Anytime you're facing a, a quarterback with the type of movement skills of Brett Favre, it puts a lot of pressure on your defense. Oh, Here is the play action fake handoff. Second guy, Edgar Bennett with a hole on the right side that you could drive a truck to the Super Bowl through. With Favre driving the truck, the pack was back at the doorstep of championship glory. Four years ago, I made a decision to come here, and everybody thought I was crazy. And now I look back at that, and I'm such in awe of what has happened here since I've been here. Well, we finally come full cycle. The Green Bay Packers are back in the Super Bowl after an absence of 29 years. Even facing two-time Super Bowl coach Bill Parcells, the Packers remain undaunted. After everything I've been through, the struggles that I've had to go through to get to that Super Bowl, once I got there, it was like a sense of relief. Hey, we got to get in there now quick. The first drive of the Super Bowl, he has in the back of his mind one audible that he wants to call. He's never called it in five years of being a quarterback there. And he calls Andre Risen to go straight up the seam of the field. And Andre Risen outruns the defensive back. Favre told me later on that that's just the kind of scenario you dream about. Super Bowl, the biggest game of your life. You say, I wish they would just do this one thing. I wish they would blitz me early and we'll just kill them. But Drew Bledsoe was determined to prove New England wasn't just another AFC patsy as he put on a super show of his own, tossing the Patriots back into a 14 to 10 lead. The ultimate judge, when people look back, you know, in five or 10 years, they're not going to remember, you know, what my completion percentage was. But if we win the Super Bowl, they're going to remember I won the Super Bowl. 
two of the league's premier quarterbacks turn the game into a personal contest of can you top this? The plays this time, he's going to go long upfield. There's Wide open. Field. Freeman, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25 down the sideline. He's Touch it away. A long pass play. And comparisons to past immortals were inevitable. What Brett has that Joe could never have was uh, the strength in his arm. And, and Joe had a good arm. He, his arm was underrated, I thought. I thought he had a very, very good arm. But Brett has some God-given tools that the other, a lot of other quarterbacks don't have. I think the great thing about Brett Favre is that he has shown that he is great when he has to be great. Hey, so we got some big plays coming. But Green Bay did not hold the monopoly on big plays. In the second half, Curtis Martin managed to step up and through the Packers' defense. Down, Curtis Martin. We can do this. We just got to make plays. That's all we got to do. The Patriots stayed within striking distance, but in the blink of an eye, the game was all but over. A high floater. Boy, this is a nice kickoff. Desmond Howard has to back up. Can't get the run from the goal line to the 5, to the 10, to the 15. Through a hole to the 20, to the 30, outside, to the 40. He made it on. Midfield, the 40, the 30, the 25, 20, the 10, 5, touchdown for Desmond Howard, 99 yards on the touchdown. The Super Bowl record run earned Desmond Howard MVP honors and kicked off a coronation for Packers football. It was something that uh, I'll be able to cherish for the rest of my life. The Pack was back, but Bill Parcells would not be. At game's end, he exited the Patriots' sidelines forever. A funny thing happened in college basketball. A star player decided to finish his education. Tim Duncan's commitment raised hopes for a title at Wake Forest and restored faith in collegiate athletics. I made a promise a long time ago to finish school, and I wanted to uphold that. And uh, also, it just goes back to I didn't feel like rushing. But by season's end, North Carolina had rushed the ACC, and the Dean of College Hoops topped Adolph Rupp's 876 wins. Smith shared the honor with a legion of players. Uh, any record I have or anything accomplished, I have to thank them and I want to thank them. North Carolina began its journey towards an 11th Final Four appearance under Smith with a squeaker against the bracket 16th seed, Fairfield. March Madness was officially underway. Three-point shooter, Stanford is two out of 11 in the game. Nine, a very tough shot, and that's a three from the corner. Rebound ahead, three seconds. Bailey. 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 Jacobson pass picked up by Bailey. Bailey. Keeps it alive, four on two, great. Kentucky appeared on a mission to repeat, eventually earning a trip back to the final game by eliminating Coach of the Year Clem Haskins and the Minnesota Golden Gophers. But it was those other Wildcats, Arizona, at the center of all the excitement. Oh, and a Providence steal. Sham God has it. Providence can win the game. Sham God. Gosh, just got fouled. Off the fingertips of Arizona with 3.9 remaining. And Lou is going to take a time. Arizona managed to prevail. Terry open shot. Arizona takes a four-point advantage. Arizona starts the celebration. They're heading to Indianapolis and the Final Four. But after having put in all that overtime to get to the Final Four, the Cats then had to face the story tradition of North Carolina. Family, one, two, three. Hey! Oh, let's go. The Tar Heels stormed out to an early advantage over Arizona. On the bench. Here's come to the alley -oop and the stop by Carter. Big concern right now by Lute Olsen. His young team in some trouble here early. Down 15-4, probably with some teams you'd, you'd really be worried. But this team has been the kind of team that, hey, they'll be down, they'll be up, they'll, you know, who knows what's going to happen next. Guards Miles Simon and Mike Bibby help the Wildcats claw their way back into the game. Coming front court now is Simon for Arizona. Here's another three, and it's good. Nobody else was hitting, and, uh, you know, I just try to take it upon myself to 
to lift the team up. He just stepped up to another level that I've never seen him step up to before. And Simon on the drive to the baseline, faking Carter. It was Simon's confidence that put Arizona on top, but it was freshman Mike Bibby's shooting touch that delivered them to the championship the game. Cats knock off their second number one seed in this tournament. Fans on their feet, the flash bulbs go off, and Kentucky wins the tip. Defending coach Rick Pitino launched his game plan alongside finals first-timer Lute Olson. Bibby in traffic. As the game's initial points went into the books. Glass. Turner off balance for Kentucky's first two. Transition, left corner Dickerson, 4-3, yes. There we go, and he falls over Rick Pitino. Arizona smothered the heralded Ron Mercer, holding him to three points in the first half. With Ron Mercer, you know, he is such a great player. But what we told Michael Dickerson and, and Jason Terry is that you cannot be screened. You get into him and you get over the screen and see whether you're, you're as tough as what he is. But Kentucky's arsenal of weapons kept the game close, weaving through 18 lead changes and 20 ties. The key fires it up good for two. These teams just went at each other's throats all night. He spots up for a three. Yeah! What a big three! Padgett looking for the tie. You can watch these teams play for days, you know, they just are so evenly matched. Kentucky needs a three to tie. Epps fires it, got it! We're going to overtime. Olsen had a simple message for his OT season group. You can quit now, you know, you've played a great game, or we can be tougher than what they are and come home with that championship trophy. Arizona nailed 10 of 14 free throws, and in spite of not scoring a field goal in OT, captured its first title. Simon Says Championship. The 1997 national champions, your Arizona Wildcats. Three in a row. In most sports, the words are a measure of a dynasty. In horse racing, they are the hallmark of excellence over a brief period of time. The Triple Crown is very hard because all three races are run within a period of five weeks. Derby on the first Saturday in May, and then the Preakness two weeks later, and then three weeks after that, the mile and a half Belmont. In 97, Silver Charm was the latest to make a run at horse racing's ultimate prize. And they're off, and touch goal came away just a touch slightly. On the inside, it's Silver Charm going right to the front as Wild Rush on the outside moves to challenge. Wild Rush with the white cap takes command. On the inside, Silver Charm back into second I, I position. I start getting the old, I'll get the game face. I might give it, give it a little bit uh, earlier. Aaron, and he moves to the outside for the drive in the Belmont. Straightening away in the lane, Silver Charm and Freehouse. They're at it again. Silver Charm under whip with Stevenson. He was waiting for a horse to come up on him. Uh, and he did not see the horse on the far outside. And by the, time, by the time he got to running again, the race was over. Touch gold on the outside! Touch gold puts a head in front! 50 yards to go! Touch gold! Touch gold wins it by half a lane. In the end, however, Silver Charm became the 14th horse to win at Kentucky and the Preakness, only to find disappointment at Belmont. The Marines were called in to save boxing in 1997, but even they couldn't supply the answer for Riddick Bowe. Bowe retired to join up, a call to arms that lasted less than 48 hours. Uh, that's a statement on Riddick Bowe's problem since he became a prize fighter. He has always had a discipline problem. It's a joke. Boxing is a circus. Nobody in this sport seems to want to fight. Akawani didn't want to fight. Sugar Ray Leonard shouldn't be fighting. Uh, Oscar De La Hoya would rather play golf, and obviously Mike Tyson would rather be uh, um, Dracula. Can I know why exactly I acted like I did? One of the most cowardly acts I've seen in sports. That's the biggest penalty. You know, a disqualification means the fight's over. The metaphor that I see that describes boxing the best was on February the 7th, Mills Lane, the referee, saw that Oliver McCall, his lower lip was quivering and he was tearing up. But Lane, on his knee, asking this fighter if he wanted to go on, that to me symbolizes the game. Mills Lane looking in the eyes of boxing. 
and saying, son, do you want to continue? It's no longer a sport of any kind of dignity. Boxing has become an American burlesque. Sports Science Show continued in track and field as Olympic gold medalist in the 200 meter, Michael Johnson, met 100 meter champ Donovan Bailey in a freak 150 meter distance to determine once and for all the world's fastest man. I first felt it about 30 meters into the race. I actually felt it tighten up. It didn't grab, but I felt it tighten up at that point. And that something wasn't quite right because of something that Donovan said. People actually start to question whether I was actually injured or you know, whether I thought that I was going to win the race or, or any of those kind of things. My strength was at the end of the race. That's 75 meters. I've never even in 200 meters, even at the Olympic Games, I wasn't winning at 75 meters. I never am. Another track and field legend, the irrepressible Carl Lewis, said goodbye to the sport he helped redefine. Carl Lewis has run his last race before his University of Houston and hometown fans. Five Olympic teams later, nine Olympic gold medals later, Carl Lewis, one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century, has now run his last lap. Lewis joined a select group of superstars who chose to leave the stage. Dean Smith carried an armful of records with him into retirement. And the legendary Mario Lemieux made it clear how his brilliant career should be remembered. I think just as, uh, as somebody that took uh, a team back in 1984 and started with the worst team in the National Hockey League and was able to, uh, to win a Stanley Cup and, and uh, um, just be remembered as a winner. In his final season, Mario once again looked to lead Pittsburgh back to the Stanley Cup Finals. But Eric Lindros and the Philadelphia Flyers did more than stand in the way. While the Flyers ruled the Eastern Conference, over in the West, the Detroit Red Wings were ready to cast off 42 years of frustration. Despite the best regular season record in 96 and a trip to the finals in 95, anything less than Lord Stanley's Cup would be unacceptable this year. Shot deflected, that was tricky. It deflected high level. There was a very quiet hunger um, that kept building throughout the playoffs. Um, that's when it started to really come out. That's when you, I think you really saw our team, um, you know, pour it all on. Detroit earned a Western Conference Championship rematch with the defending champion, Colorado Avalanche. They would not disappoint. Just to, uh, to have the celebration, to do it back in Detroit. I mean, everybody was loving it. And uh, uh, it's probably the sweetest feeling that a lot of guys have been associated with. Revenge on the avalanche was worthy of celebration, but all of Detroit wanted more. Every year, at the end of the year, I think every player is the same way. I think every coach feels the same way. When the season's over and you don't win the Stanley Cup, there's an empty feeling. Philadelphia, birthplace of the nation, served as host for game one. But Detroit was determined to demonstrate who earned the name Hockey Town. Series MVP Mike Vernon silenced the flyer attack while the Red Wings continued to put the biscuit in the basket. The 
The Flyers were desperate to change their luck in Game 2. We'll make changes for Game 2. Coach Terry Murray announcing yesterday that Garth Snow would take over for Ron Hextall in goal. Here we go, Rico. Come on, Jay. Come on, Jay. Here we go, Johnny Jersey. Here we go, Randy. Here we go. Here we go. But Detroit remained unrelenting in its attack, and Philadelphia needed to pressure Vernon in hopes of allowing Garth Snow to settle in. That's pretty good pace to start this hockey game. Did he go line and shoot? Need him a wind up, shoots, scores! Now we got a hockey game. Now we got a hockey game. Unfazed by Philly's effort, the Red Wings regained control of the game and the series. With a two game lead, Detroit headed home thinking nothing but sweep as the change in venue did little to stem the Red Wings' charge. Strong here now, strong here now, Oh, my God, oh, my And again, it's Garth One time game, boys. And a break. Now he's in front, scores! In front, Middleton scores! Hockey's longest championship drought was about to end. Good evening, everybody. Yes, here we go, game four. If they didn't come up with the game of their lives individually, they'll all re always regret it. Now it's picked up by Podine. Around the net, he's out to the backhander. Oh, Vernon with Vernon tending to an MVP performance, Detroit looked for an offensive hero. It would eventually come by way of Darren McCarty. Go better every ship, boy. Forty-two years of waiting was over. It's my pleasure to present the Stanley Cup to Steve Eiserman. After a four-decade absence, Detroit's celebration of the Cup was scheduled into the summer, but it was tragically interrupted weeks later when Slava Fetisov and Vladimir Konstantinov were injured in an automobile crash. Konstantinov critical. So this team is a special team. You know, it's uh, I've been through a lot last, you know, summer. The reaction was unbelievable. They uh, stay in the hospital overnight with them holding uh, their wives in our hands. And I mean, it's more than a hockey team. I believe now it's uh, it's like a family. Such a real life tragedy puts sports into perspective and reminds us all that our heroes, too, are mortal. It was only fitting that in a year that saw both tradition and change, two startup leagues, the WNBA and ABL, struck a blow for equal opportunity in professional basketball. And while one league had all the glitter, the other showcased most of the stars. Competition in the ABL was fierce as the new league boldly met and even exceeded expectations. Columbus succeeded in its quest for the inaugural ABL title. And two months later, the WNBA took center stage in front of capacity crowds. Rebecca Lobo won her 102nd consecutive game, dating back through her Olympic experience all the way to her days at UConn. But her New York Liberty eventually faltered against Cheryl Miller's Phoenix Mercury. Equally impressive was Cynthia Cooper, after 11 years of playing professionally overseas, the eventual WNBA MVP finally got to play a home game. When the individual awards came, they were great. They were wonderful. They were dreams come true. But the, it would have been bittersweet if I had won the Most Valuable Player Award and lost the championship game. Cooper led her Houston Comets to the title, and along with teammate Cheryl Swoops, shared in a celebration bigger than any championship. For me to be a part of the first ever WNBA championship team was definitely a dream come true. And the Houston Comets make history. 
And just so we didn't forget them amidst all the hoopla, the NBA celebrated a half century of heroics by selecting its top 50 players of all time. Nearly all the legends were present at the All-Star Weekend ceremonies, with at least one notable exception, Shaquille O'Neal, whose conspicuous absence was as controversial as his selection to the elite group. But neither issue had the impact on the game as his preseason coast-to-coast -coast flight from Orlando to Hollywood. I think uh, Shaq going from Orlando to the Lakers had a huge effect on the NBA. Maybe it wasn't obvious to everybody, but um, you listen to the conversations thereafter of Alonzo Mourning, for instance. Charlotte made a conscious decision. We're going to trade him before we get Shaquille O'Neal. Alonzo found his way to Miami for the year, while Detroit's marquee performer Grant Hill was content on driving his game to new heights in the Motor City. And while young guns like Allen Iverson, Kevin Garnett, and even Kobe Bryant looked to make their mark on the game, Michael remained the standard. One of the things about Michael's uh, ability to bring his game up to another level is that he has uh, found ways to, even better than ever before to give the team over to certain concepts. The team concept, the shooter's concept, get the ball inside. As a team leader, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to pick up where the team may be lacking. And over in the season, you know, I had to carry that load for a little while. And, and, and I don't have a problem with that. I think that shows competitiveness within me to take over some of that responsibility. And I'm not afraid to relinquish it whenever I see that the players are starting to, to take, a, take their roles and expand it. Even more amazing than the Bulls' regular season stampede was the rise of Phoenix from an 0-13 start to a playoff berth. We were stunned. We were in shock. I mean, we really didn't realize what was happening, and we got humbled. The Suns would take Seattle to a full five games in the opening round before setting in the West. While the L.A. Lakers and Houston Rockets looked impressive in early rounds, in the end, the West was won by Utah and the NBA's most valuable player, Carl Malone. I mean, winning the MVP, uh, us winning 64 games, having uh, the best record in the West, home court advantage, that don't mean anything. You still got to go do it. Carl Malone was getting tired of not being there, and there's not a whole lot of years left in his career. And I think now that they went to the finals and they did what they did, gives him the hope that, you know what, with this unit, we still have a shot at it. They had a lot of momentum riding with them. You know, Carl's an MVP. Everything is kind of rolling over in their way. We're coming into the series worried with Scottie Pippen being able to play the first game of the uh, series. We know we're in, in for a good series. Carl Malone had game one in hand, but when he missed two crucial free throws, yet another game-winning opportunity found its way into the hands of Michael Jordan. Seven and five tenths left. MJ, top of the circle, hangs, fires, scores! He knocked it in at the buzzer, Bulls winner! How many times has he done that? I've had so many, I can't even remember them all. Back to Michael, circles, runs in. Chicago delivered a repeat of bowl performance in game two and seized control of the series. We just got waxed tonight as a whole. And uh, now we go home. And now you go home to try to protect uh, your home court. Returning to Utah, the Jazz faced a must-win situation, and the burden of delivery rested with Malone. Anyone that knows Carl Malone should have known that he was going to come back, because not only is he a terrific basketball player, he's very, very mentally tough, and he doesn't quit on himself or anybody else. I don't want to get caught up in saying to myself, God, i got to play like MVP. i got to play like an MVP. And by looking at that trophy, it's going to make you say that instead of coming out and just playing the game. By grabbing games three and four, the Jazz had regained their confidence and had the Bulls questioning their latest performance. We'd blown game four. We'd had the five-point lead with a minute and something left on the clock, and you know, Stockton hit a three-pointer, made a steal on Michael. They made a couple spectacular plays to take that game out of our hands. Going into game five, the Jazz had the momentum, Michael had the flu. The worst thing that can happen to, your, to the opposing team is for one of these superstars to be injured or to be sick because they get cranky, they get angry. It's really like a wounded bear, and they get nasty. And as sick as Michael Jordan was, we all knew he was going to play, and we all knew he would step up as big as he could. 
Russell to the free throw line. Hangs in the air. Jumper good. Oh, shots. Nothing but net for Mike. Jordan added yet another chapter to his legacy and put the Bulls back in control of the series. While all eyes looked towards MJ to win game six, Jordan looked elsewhere. And I saw Michael in the huddle sitting there thinking for a little while. And, and finally, he turned to me and he said, they're going to double team me and I think it's going to be Stockton. Uh, so you'd be ready to shoot. And, and I just kind of looked at him and I said, OK. <laughs> I, I hope I, I'll make it. The Chicago Bulls had a dynasty before they won this last championship. Uh, they're the most dominant team in the 90s and probably could have won more championships, obviously, had Jordan been around. In women's tennis, 16-year-old Martina Hingis ushered in a new era at the Australian Open. Before it was Martina Chris, then it was Gabby, Steffi, then it was Jennifer, myself, and now we have the young ones coming up, and our number one player is very young. Hampered by injury at the French, Hingis managed to eliminate Celis before succumbing in the finals, but she quickly rebounded for the prestige of Wimbledon. And as you walk in here, you walk in the center court, and you're at the site here on the grounds, you, you know you're at Wimbledon, and you feel kind of the, the excitement in the air from the people, from the media, and you, you just feel like this is a major, major event. As many tournaments as I play a year, you can't get you know, up for everyone like a Wimbledon or a U.S. Open. Number one ranked Pete Sampras rolled through the competition with majestic ease, and by winning his 10th Grand Slam event at the ripe old age of 25, he earned himself a permanent place among the greats of the game. Hingis, however, seems determined to accomplish as much and even sooner. It was appropriate that the new star of tennis should shine at the newly dedicated Arthur Ashe Stadium, site of the U.S. Open. And with the shocking elimination of Sampras, the focus shifted to the women's final. Martina's opponent would be the surprising Venus Williams in a match that cemented the resurgence of women's tennis. Hingis swept the first set six love. Venus rose briefly to the challenge before faltering. Again, Hingis emerged victorious, taking her third major title of the year. And the future for women's tennis never looked brighter. Generation Next was on course in the world of golf as well. Ernie Els, Justin Leonard, and Tiger Woods announced that golf was the new game in town. And at the Masters, Woods proved himself bigger than the game itself. Never has anyone performed more brilliantly at Augusta. By the final round, this was no longer a golf match. His record-setting performance was a historic event. I knew what has happened in history in, in, in golf, and I knew that um, I wanted to be a part of it in my own way. It's just a minority issue in general. Um, I'm just the first one to ever do it and uh, hopefully there'll be a lot more behind me. 50 years earlier, Jackie Robinson set out on a journey which would revolutionize baseball and help redefine America. To mark the anniversary, teams all across the country paid tribute to the courage of one of the most important figures of the 20th century. Today, I think every American should say a special word of thanks 
to Jackie Robinson and to Branch Rickey and to the members of the Dodger team who made him one of their own and proved that America is a better, stronger, richer country when we all work together and give everyone a chance. I believe that the greatest tribute that we can pay to Jackie Robinson is to gain new support for a more equitable society. And in this heady environment of unity, it is my hope that we can carry this living legacy beyond this glorious moment. This is a great moment for all of us. Number 42, from this day forward, will never again be issued by a major league club. Baseball introduced a new look in 97. As usual, some of the game's most popular stars showcased their talents in new uniforms. But no switch was more telling of today's game than the mid-season trade that brought home run slugger Mark McGuire from Oakland to St. Louis. What, what do you do if you're in Oakland? You know, do you, do you stop going to the games because they, they can't keep the best home run hitter in the game? I mean, they really loved him in St. Louis, and they all thought it was like Paul Bunyan had stepped out of the woods. Fair ball, 51. Oh, it's gone! Goodbye, baseball! McGuire and Ken Griffey both flirted with Roger Maris's record 61 home run. He's four. Twin on in, Nelson, with an upper deck home run! Nothing is as glamorous. No record in sports is as glamorous as Roger Maris' 61. And just to take a little run at it, a little brush with it, was, was a great show. But while tradition remained in the record books, change took place on the field when interleague play became a reality. Classic Subway Series were revived, and Old World Series rivals clashed once more. There's a breaking ball, and it's ripped to right field, and O'Neill is going to get there. For once, it seemed the great lords of baseball were listening to the fans. And the Mets have been beaten by the Red Sox, 8-4. to four. It's just another short fix solution to things. Um, attendance is down. Well, let's make these bizarre matchups. Let's take the immediate gratification. The Florida Marlins' loose purse strings paid off in a quick trip to the postseason. They had told me during negotiations that, you know, they were willing to go out and spend money on players if it made sense. The high-priced roster helped the wildcard Marlins knock off the Giants before taking on the defending National League champion Braves. Johnson's throw! Got him! After six games, Atlanta suffered another bitter disappointment. A swing and a miss, and that'll finish Lopez and the Braves. In the American League, the focus was on Seattle's Randy Johnson. He's 6'10", and he's not the most handsome guy in the world. And I think Baltimore, if any team, uh, just didn't get intimidated, didn't feel intimidated. Drilled down the left field line and in there. Johnson compiled a 20 and 2 record against the rest of the league, but would come up winless against the Orioles. He's going to score on the double by Boarding. Meanwhile, the Indians had eliminated the defending champion Yankees, earning a showdown with Baltimore in the ALCS. The six games were highlighted by Mike Messina's 15 strikeout performance in game three, but the Orioles would eventually lose game three and the series. The Tribe would attempt to grab its first title since 1948. In stark contrast, their opponent would be an expansion team that made it to the series faster than any franchise since 1905. Tradition and change were clashing once again. And in the fourth inning of game one, the clash exploded in favor of the Marlins. Deep to left. If it's fair, it's a three-run homer. It's out of here. And now this ball is belted. Back to back and into the upper deck. Florida batted around in the inning and then watched 22-year-old Levon Hernandez calmly deliver a World Series MVP performance. 3-2 pitch. Hernandez somehow came up with that ball. Cleveland tied the series before heading home, but with game three knotted at seven going into the ninth, the Marlins really got on a roll. And now more. Sheffield on the first pitch, knocks home two more with a single to right. What a night he has had. Hit to the whole base hit. It's going to sound like a football score. 
It's 14 to seven. The Indians tease the hometown faithful with a comeback of their own in the bottom of the inning. One run home, two runs home, 14 to 11. Mm -hmm. A slow roller, Council charging, throwing, it's over. But after more than four frigid hours, Cleveland came up short. The series eventually returned to Florida for game six, with the Marlins on the brink of capturing their first title. But Cleveland would look to Chad O.J. to force a seventh game, and O.J. would exceed expectations. And he lines the ball into right field for a base hit. How about that? One run home. Second man being waved in. Johnson leaps to the peg, and by the time he comes down, the Indians are in front two to nothing. After collecting his first two major league hits, O.J. returned to the mound and closed the door. There would be a seventh game. Cleveland pinned its championship hopes on the arm of Jarrett Wright, just three years out of high school and two outs away from victory. But the Marlins had plans for a different ending. The 1-1 one, one pitch. A deep drive to Wright. Ramirez on the run. Makes the catch. Tagging is a move. Game seven of the World Series is tied. Craig Council had delivered. In the 10th, Tony Fernandez took his turn. All the opposite way before Rob Nen answered again and out. again. Struck him out. In the bottom of the 10th, Moises Alou had his shot at immortality. A high fly ball. Each team sent its potential hero into the harsh glare of the series spotlight. Brenner in on the ice and right to complete the double play. The game and the series had woven its way to a dramatic conclusion, and it would be Edgar Renteria who would deliver. The Marlins were world champions. A series, season, and year remembered. Individual achievement and team success put its indelible mark on 1997. But the year is defined with a dash of distinction for the way it balanced tradition and change, and how it shared its new heroes with revered legends. I don't feel bad. I really feel good about myself because I gave it 100%. You know, I try to hang in there. I had to do some thinking. I mean, you know, a disqualification means the fight's over. This is a game I've been playing since I was three years old, so it's been a part of me uh, as far as I can remember. It was a great opportunity for women and young girls to have to watch us play as all of our dreams come true. And I saw Michael in the huddle. He turned to me and he said, you'd be ready to shoot. And, and I just kind of looked at him and I said, okay. <laughs> has happened in golf. I want to be a part of it in my own life.